Ah, one of my favorite people right here in this other seat uh, asked me to record uh, the audiobook for Middle Game, and it was my honor to do it. I almost lost my voice because it is a rather large tome. Can be used as a weapon. Um, but it was really like engrossing. I've read a number of audiobooks, and I've never been so engrossed in something that I was like, oh my god, the day's over. We recorded seven chapters. How did we. we I don't know what's happening in my life anymore. Um, it, it's just one of those books that like takes you out of your brain and puts you into a whole different universe. One that is similar to ours, but also very different. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions because, you know, reading the audiobook, I'm like, I want to know why this, that, and the other. And then I'm going to open it up to you guys and let you guys ask some questions. Um, so middle game. What was the genesis of the book? Also, how many times did you rewrite it? And would the first draft know the published book? So the Genesis was actually a song written by Dr. Mary Kroll, who is a musicologist from Athens, Alabama, that I've worked with on several projects. And because she's a musicologist, she has studied music history and musical theory. And there's this concept that the Greeks came up with called the Doctrine of Ethos, which said that music controls the universe. And if you use the right musical modes, you can actually reshape the universe. Um, and so there were musical modes that were actively forbidden in Greece, unless you were a member of a certain class, because they didn't want the proletariat to, you know, use Dorian mode and reshape who was in charge. Uh, they took these things very, very seriously. And uh, she wrote a song about it, which is called The Doctrine of Ethos, and explains the whole concept very succinctly in five minutes. And uh, she played that for me in 2004, and I became obsessed. And so the genesis of the book really was, I want to write a book that suits this song, and that is worthy of this specific song. And then Mary gets mad if I try to say that she had anything to do with me writing it. I'm like, Mary, you love the book. Well, you're just giving me too much credit. I'm not. I'm not. She's in the book. She's in the book. Like, I quoted the song in the book. Um, I don't know how many times I rewrote it. It was about a two-year process once I actually wrote the darn thing down. Um, and one of the big things was that in the very first draft, there is no Deborah Baker. There is no Over the Woodward Wall. I actually used The Wizard of Oz originally. And that's why there are quite so many parallels, because I had to rewrite the Alchemy and Oz book to take Oz out. So on that basis, the, the published draft would have no idea what to do with the first draft. Um, also, there was a weird subplot involving try to, trying to get Roger to eat his broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Dodger, who's from California and grew up with a lot better produce, thinks that this Massachusetts boy that doesn't want to eat his broccoli has something wrong with him. And it's just like, mmm, veggie! <laughs> uh, and that got cut as too much tormenting your brother for fun, which is a thing I do to my brothers. So, so in the book, you have um, a number... So, so I guess maybe... If we want to like give everybody a little taste of like what the book is, do you have like maybe like a couple of sentences that sort of describe? That's asking a lot, isn't it? I, I think the sentence that describes the book best is the very first, which is "There's so much blood." <laughs> <laughs> like the book opens with "There is so much blood," and any question of who wrote it pretty much goes out. <laughs> 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 so, so many times in the book, there's so much blood. I think yeah. I said it like 30 times, probably <laughs> throughout the whole book. Probably about that. But uh -huh. all of the other lines that I think really sum it up come from the very last chapter, and so those are massive spoilers. We don't want to spoil. <laughs> we don't want to spoil yeah. people. Um, needless to say, there are, are the protagonists in the book are ro a brother and sister, Roger and Dodger. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I found really interesting when I was reading the book is that so it's so hard to talk about it without giving stuff yep. away. And I love the fact that the book that is finally getting people to go, wait, this chick that's written 55 books in 10 years is actually a serious author. Oh, yeah. It's the one with characters who have the stupidest names <laughs> I could possibly come up with. Roger and Dodger. Like, they they rhyme on purpose. Aaron it's, and Darren. It's sympathetic magic. But it means that all of these big, serious review outlets have had to be like, Roger is very good at language, and Dodger enjoys mathematics, and I cannot believe I just wrote that sentence. <laughs> I think I'm causing them actual psychological pain. Oh, I, I, I think you are, too. Um, so, with, I don't want to give anything away, but they, they both have talent abilities. They are, they're kind of created by, mm -hmm. by sort of our, our, our big our, villain, our bad guy, our, bad yeah. guy, our big James bad, Reed. James Reed, and, and his sort of associate Lee. Um, 
what I thought was really interesting is that instead of ascribing traits based on gender, you went by birth order. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk a little bit about like what the genesis of that was, like why you decided to give the, each character, you know, like Roger's really great with languages and and Dodger's really great with, with math, math because it, they were each one half of the Doctrine of mm -hmm. Ethos. So, mm -hmm. um, lyrics and music basically is is what they represent. And I don't think any attribute or trait is actually gender. Agreed. Um, which is part of why Roger gets the more traditionally feminine and acceptable mm -hmm. specialization that. and Dodger gets to be a math kid uh, because I think a lot of us were gifted kids in school. Uh, being a gifted kid just means you're ahead of where they think you should be for your age. So a lot of us were geniuses until around third grade when we aged out of it. Um, <laughs> Roger and Dodger don't age out of being geniuses. But the girls I knew who were math geniuses or science geniuses got bullied. They got pushed back from adults and kids. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't have any safe place to go. It was like everybody put them on this pedestal of genius and then stood around the base of it chucking rocks and screaming to see when they'd fall off. Mm -hmm. But if you were a language kid, if you were really into reading or really into writing, um, and especially if you were a girl really into poetry, Mm -hmm. That was great. That was safe and understandable. And so I wanted to flip those two because otherwise it's just the stereotypical masculine and the stereotypical yeah. feminine in a lot of ways. No, that's one of the things I loved about it. And that the, the idea that like Roger has more of like a sexual life, whereas mm -hmm. Dodger is obsessed with her career and with math. And I just, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was a nice flipping of, of the traditional gender roles yeah, I, which is are annoying. I don't consider her to be ace rep because yeah, she never actually ask she you. doesn't embrace that identity. No. So I don't mm -hmm. consider her to count as you're giving good representation, but she also doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. Very literally. <laughs> <laughs> she has no interest whatsoever in sex with anyone. Yeah. Um, also, when you develop a telepathic connection with your brother at the age of nine, the idea of getting it on, like they have to schedule masturbation. And that's an awkward talk to have. I promise you, I will set an alarm to get up two hours before you so that I can whack off before you wake up and have to experience this in my head. <laughs> Roger is much more interested in having a sex life, and he's having real issues with that by the end of the book. He's like, kind of very sensitive. He, you know, he falls in love very easily, he does. and she's very. She kind of eschews love. She doesn't really like people. Yeah. <laughs> what made you decide to set some of it on the West Coast and like the Bay Area, and the other in the Boston area? Well, because I said it started out kind of with Oz mm -hmm. modeling. The original map of Oz was the United States divided into four countries with the Emerald City at the very middle. And uh, because I had to keep certain structural mm -hmm. elements, that's how the up and under works too. They have four countries divided among the elements and among the suits of the tarot. And uh, that meant that putting them on opposite sides of the country put them in countries, ma alchemically speaking, mm -hmm. it put them in countries that were as diametrically opposed to each other as possible. Um, and if you want to hide them from each other, that's the way you go about it. Uh, plus, one of my brothers lives just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, tormenting him with this book was <laughs> really joyful. <laughs> and you actually, if I, if I am speaking out of turn, tell me, but you actually wrote the other book. I did. Over the Woodward Wall is written and will be coming out from Tor.com next year um, under the name A. Deborah Baker. So now there's another of me. <laughs> uh, someone was going to send me that, and someone didn't. Oh, someone forgot. <laughs> someone was going to mail it to me from her hotel room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's like you're reading two books at once. Mm -hmm. um, and when you told me you wrote the whole thing, I was like, wait, I want that. Where's that? <laughs> um, so physics plays a part in this book. Um, in, under the guise of like entanglement mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you have the, the doctrine and you have two sides of the doctrine was that something that kind of inspired you or am I just reading into it <laughs> I, I think you're reading into it a little bit mm -hmm. there um, physics plays into it a bit mm -hmm. but there's a lot of mention of quantum entanglement and stuff mm -hmm. which is not necessarily accurate that's mm -hmm. the characters trying to explain an unexplainable gotcha. situation that's what I was curious about yeah they have no idea what's going on for most of the book. <laughs> Neither did my editor, so <laughs> that was fun. Actually, no, Lee, Lee got it very quickly, but uh, this book baffled my agent for a while. She's like, I don't know how to sell this. It's the best thing you've ever written, but it's, how do you explain it? <laughs> what is it about? And I said, mathematics and siblings and alchemy. And she said, yeah, that's not an elevator pitch. <laughs> 
Um, speaking of alchemy, it plays a, a big part in the book. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, alchemists that you referred to when you were writing? You can't actually find classical alchemists anymore, just like you can't find classical mm -hmm. adherence to miasma theory, because it's been so profoundly disproven mm -hmm. that we've kind of moved past it. But if you go back into the historical, mm -hmm. there were a lot of extremely smart people. Yeah like people that we still hold up today as this person was a genius and they influenced the sciences forever, who believed that alchemy was real and that if you could just harness the forces of the elements properly, you could do all of these remarkable and incredible things. Uh, the book's reliance on alchemy makes me think it would have been completely unsaleable in a pre-Harry Potter world. Yeah. Uh, because mm -hmm. more people know about alchemy thanks to Harry Potter <laughs> than uh, just about anything else. Um shut down with all That's my questions okay. on it um so um so we talked about like the, the first draft of the book and the fact that your agent wasn't sure how to sell it how did mm -hmm. that because as a writer oftentimes you want to write what moves you were you thinking about well i can change this and make it more sellable or were you just telling the story you wanted to tell i was just telling the story i wanted to tell um so every day I have a word count goal, pretty much, unless it's day like today, which was travel, mm -hmm. into dinner, into book event. And uh, those are all based on what my deadlines are. And if I can write far enough ahead of my deadline, if I can just finish that book six months early, I get some free play. And in free play, if I keep making my word count every day, it doesn't have to be something we've already sold. So I, um, I wrote the pitch for Middle Game, which was four pages long, and gave it to Diana. And she had no idea what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> and to be fair to her, I've reread the pitch since then, and I have no idea what the hell I was talking about. Um, but she bounced it back to me and said, this is too confusing. We can't sell this. And my response was to, in a fit of peak, write the entire book in six weeks. <laughs> um, as one does. It was free play, so it was fine. <laughs> Like, normally I'd try to knock out the next Toby book so that I have a full book in my buffer, but this time it's like, no, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do this for me. And uh, I finished and it was very confusing, and I gave it to her and told her to sell it. And she did. <laughs> because my agent is a wizard. <laughs> is the pro was the process for Middle Game the same as your other books where you give to beta readers and you go mm -hmm. through this whole... What was sort of the response? Because it's very different than the other stuff that you It write. is. Um, my, my beta readers, by and large, are people who enjoy my work, which I think is mm -hmm. important because they can still be critical, but they're yeah. not like, this is horrible, I hate you, uh, <laughs> which is what Goodreads is for. And, yes. um, so uh, I did get a couple of them early in asking why this wasn't a Mira Grant book because it had so much research in it and so much blood. Yeah. And I said, well, because Mira does science and Shauna does magic, and I'm pretty sure alchemy is more on the magic side. Um, but they liked it, and they were all very happy when it sold. Um, so when you sit down to write a book, you talk about like you're, you're, you're literally writing like two or three things at once. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit, moving away from Just Middle Game, about your process for writing. Like It's almost like you have to take off one hat and put on a different hat every time you change something that you're working on. Well, it's like changing channels on the TV. You just switch from watching Grey's Anatomy to watching Chicago PD, and you have a whole different set of characters. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a different person when you're writing the Mira Grant stuff versus the Shannon stuff? No, because I still have to clean up cat views. <laughs> <laughs> if, if another person would come to my house and clean up the cat puke for me when I wrote under a different name, I would do that more. <laughs> 